Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Holly, we've had kind of a run of 1919 episodes recently. I know, we did not plan that. It just keeps happening. Yeah, we had a a collection of of centennials slash coincidences. We have one more. I think this is the last, at least in terms of what I have on my plate, like this is the last 1919 thing for a bit. I make no promises. I don't know. (laughs) I'll find out halfway through a thing that it's related to 1919 and then be like, well, here we go. (laughs) That's what we said. Uh, We've gotten several listener requests for this one over the last few months as well, including from Adrian, Donna, and Sheena. And this one is the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. It has some things in common with last month's episode on the Limerick Soviet. Some of the context is similar. Both things involve strikes that basically shut down a whole city. But otherwise, these two events have a lot of differences, both in how they progressed and in their impact on their respective countries. So even though we just talked about a strike, they're very different stories. In the wake of World War I, Canada was facing many of the same issues that have come up in our other recent 1919 episodes. During the war, the cost of living had risen dramatically, as much as 75% in some parts of the country. Wages had risen by more like 10 to 15%, so working people were facing huge financial difficulties. Most working people weren't making enough money to pay for food for their families, let alone meeting their other basic needs. On top of all that, as the military was demobilized after the war, soldiers and sailors were returning home just as wartime industries were shutting down. This was happening in other parts of the world, too. Unemployment was a huge problem, and there wasn't a lot of transition support for these returning veterans when they were trying to re-enter civilian life, often without being able to find a job. As was happening in the United States, Canada was also in the middle of a Red Scare following the 1917 Russian Revolution. It was a climate of suspicion and fear of Bolshevism and communism. These fears weren't just a reaction to the revolution, though. They were also a response to changing patterns of immigration. These changes were happening in much of the country, but since today's episode is about events in Winnipeg, Manitoba, we are going to focus on that part of it. Before the mid-1800s, most Europeans in Manitoba were French. French Canadians became a minority in Manitoba in the 1870s and 1880s as large numbers of people of British ancestry arrived from Britain as well as from other parts of Canada, particularly Ontario, which is the province next door. But in the 1900s and 19-teens, more and more people started immigrating to Canada and specifically to Manitoba from Russia and Eastern Europe. The population of Winnipeg soared to about 190,000 people, making it Canada's third largest city, with a significant population of Slavic and Jewish immigrants. These shifting demographics sparked a deep sense of racism and resentment among Anglo-Canadians, who feared these immigrants weren't assimilating into British Canadian society and were bringing Bolshevism and communism to Canada with them. Slavic and Jewish immigrants definitely weren't the only people facing discrimination and racism in Winnipeg in 1919. The region's First Nations population had been forced onto reserves under a series of treaties and laws, including the Indian Act of 1876. These were meant to eradicate First Nations cultures and to force assimilation into European Canadian and particularly Anglo-Canadian society. These laws did not apply to the Métis, who were people of both European and indigenous ancestry. And Winnipeg had a significant Métis population. Many lived in the outer edge of southwest Winnipeg in a community known as Roostertown. The origins of that particular name are not clear. But before 1919, many of Winnipeg's Métis population worked delivering water door-to-door. But early that year, construction was finished on an aqueduct that connected Winnipeg to Shoal Lake, providing the city with a new supply of fresh water. But Shoal Lake was in Anishinaabe territory, so the completion of this aqueduct was delivering water to Winnipeg, but it was doing so by taking water from the Anishinaabe specifically from the Shoal Lake 40 Reserve, who were not really consulted or even considered during this process. And this is something that has never been resolved. The aqueduct's construction created what was basically an artificial island. So Shoal Lake 40 is literally surrounded by Winnipeg's supply of fresh water, but has been under a boil order for its own water for more than 20 years. 
The aqueduct's completion also put much of Winnipeg's Métis population out of work, and there were few other industries open to them. All of this was underpinning the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919, although on its surface, the strike started out as a simple labor dispute. During the 19-teens, many of Canada's industries were starting to unionize, and union membership was growing dramatically. But this process was really inconsistent from one industry to another, and even in different parts of the same industry. By the end of World War I, workers in some industries had formed unions, but those unions were not recognized yet. Others had formed unions that were recognized and had negotiated contracts for their members, but hadn't been as successful as they had hoped for getting terms that they wanted. The nature of the unions themselves had also started to shift. Most of Canada's first unions were craft unions, and they were connected to one specific trade. Members of the unions all did the same essential job, and the union's focus was on workplace issues that were very specific to its members and their craft. But by the late 19-teens, a lot of industries were shifting over to an industrial union model, where, for example, everyone who worked for the railroad was part of a railroad workers' union, regardless of exactly what type of work they were doing for the railroad. As a general trend, industrial unions were more focused on politics than craft unions were. Both types of unions might vote to strike over things like pay or working conditions, but industrial unions also tried to get members or sympathetic people into the government to change the laws that affected their workplaces and industries. During the First World War, most Canadians had considered it unpatriotic for workers to go on strike. And then in the later part of the war, an order in council prohibited workers from striking. Once the war was over, though, and that order in council was nullified, things started to change. More unions started using strikes as a tool to try to improve their pay and working conditions. But even so, the victories tended to be really small. A successful strike might involve a wage increase of just a few pennies. And this wasn't unique to Canada or to 1919. It was part of a pattern in many parts of the world, both before and after 1919. In 1918, for example, a partial general strike in Winnipeg secured higher wages for the members of four civic unions. Winnipeg's 1919 strike started with its metal and building workers. Both of these industries had lots of small unions that had established councils to try to represent all of them together. These were the Building Trades Council and the Metal Trades Council. The idea was that the unions had more bargaining power than workers did individually, but then these councils had more bargaining power than the individual unions did if they were trying to negotiate separately. But the metal and building industries had nearly opposite responses to this attempt to collectively bargain. The Builders' Exchange was open to the idea of negotiating with the Building Trades Council. Negotiating with all the builders' unions at once seemed like an efficient way to get one contract in place that applied to everyone. But even though the Builders' Exchange was expecting a post-war housing boom, it didn't think it could meet the Building Trades Council's demands for better pay. Meanwhile, Winnipeg's three biggest metalworking companies were Manitoba Bridge and Ironworks, the Vulcan Ironworks, and the Dominion Bridge Company. These were together known as the Big Three. While the Builders' Exchange was expecting to get more work after the war, a lot of the metal production had been tied to wartime industries that were being shut down, so the Big Three weren't really open to negotiating with the entire Metal Trades Council at once. They thought they would get better terms by working with the 19 member unions individually. They also sort of seemed more interested in saying that they supported workers' rights to collectively bargain than in actually recognizing and bargaining with the unions. People felt like they were getting a lot of lip service from them. On May 1st, 1919, the Building Trades Council voted to go on strike, having been unsuccessful in their negotiations for higher wages. The next day, the members of the Metal Trades Council walked off the job as well, not only because they wanted better pay and a 40-hour work week, but also because they wanted the Big Three to recognize the Metal Trades Council as their collective bargaining unit. These weren't the only workers voting to strike. Winnipeg streetcar workers voted to strike at about the same time, although their strike didn't start immediately. And then in mid-May, workers in other industries throughout the city joined the building and metal workers in a sympathetic strike. And we'll talk more about that after a sponsor break. 
The Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, or WTLC, is a labor council that represents a whole collection of member unions, and it still exists today. On May 6, 1919, the WTLC polled its members about whether to join the building and metal unions in a sympathetic strike, and the result was an overwhelming yes, with more than 11,000 people voting in favor of going on strike and fewer than 600 voting no. People voting yes generally wanted to support the striking building and metal workers and to reinforce the idea of collective bargaining in Winnipeg. People voting no did so for a number of reasons. Some thought that a strike wasn't necessary in this case. Others were in lower-paying industries and didn't think they should have to go without income to support people who were at the higher end of the pay scale for Winnipeg's unionized workers. The general strike began at 11 a.m. on May 15th. That was the official start time, although some people were striking earlier than that. Some of the first workers to walk out were the switchboard operators, also known as the Hello Girls. They clocked out at the end of their shift at 7 a.m., and the next shift didn't come on to replace them. Also among the first to walk out were the bread and cake workers, which was another largely female occupation with shifts that ended in the very early morning hours. The sympathetic strike included both public and private employees. Public employees included police and firefighters, postal workers, utility workers. Private employees included people who worked in factories and shops and in transportation. About 30,000 workers went on strike, and about half of those participating did so even though they weren't in a union. This brought the entire city to an almost immediate standstill. A strike committee was also established to manage the strike itself and to keep essential services running as the strike was going on. Its 53 members were elected from each of the WTLC's member unions. Two of the committee were women. Meanwhile, Winnipeg's business and civic leaders formed the Citizens Committee of 1,000 to both oppose the strike and to recruit people to replace the striking workers in essential industries. The Citizens Committee was extremely secretive, and it wasn't always clear who was and wasn't a member, and which efforts they were organizing and which were being handled by other people. In general, though, many of its members came from the Winnipeg Board of Trade, the Winnipeg branch of the Canadian Manufacturers Association, and the Manitoba Bar Association. Shortly after the strike started, the Citizens Committee, the Strike Committee, and representatives from the Winnipeg government all met to try to work out a plan to keep things like the switchboard and the water system and milk and bread delivery and firefighting operational. The result was an agreement that these types of services could continue to operate with a permit that was issued by the strike committee. This included things like the milk delivery trucks having placards in the front that they were, quote, permitted by authority of the strike committee. Very similar to some of the businesses during the Limerick strike we talked about. Exactly. Here's an explanation published by William Ivins in the Western Labor News on May 17th. It ran under the headline, Why Some Industries Are Running. And it read... Quote, theaters and picture shows are running under strike permit so that the worker can keep off the streets. Milk and bread concerns are running under permits to feed the people. Hospitals are given permits so that the sick may not suffer. Water is kept at low pressure rather than cut off so that the workers shall be able to get it. Light is supplied for the same reason. So it is with all these industries that work under permit of the strike committee. They are supplying the prime necessities of life to the workers so that the fight may be carried on until it is won. All these concerns are organized fully and could be stopped at a minute's notice, but for the present, the strike committee believes that it is better to let them run. Hence, it's order for them to stay on the job under permit. The Citizens Committee and the Winnipeg government were deeply opposed to the idea that essential services were being permitted by the strike committee. It seemed too much like the strike committee had just decided when and how to run the city. So the Citizens Committee and the government started focusing their attention on breaking the strike and on getting people back to work as soon as possible. To that end, the Citizens Committee organized its own volunteers to replace striking workers. This included 600 people to operate the telephone and telegraph exchange, a volunteer fire department, and a volunteer security team to guard the fireboxes so that the fire department wasn't driven to exhaustion by false alarms. Some of the false alarms were pranks, and others were meant to intentionally harass the strikebreakers. 
The Citizens Committee also brought in volunteers to pump gas at the gas stations and to run the pumps in the municipal water system. The strike committee denounced all these volunteer groups as scabs. But there was a whole other layer to all of this. Besides just the striking workers on one side and the Citizens Committee and the city government on the other side, the government and the Citizens Committee also became absolutely convinced that this was not a simple labor dispute at all. Instead, they believed that radical communists and Bolshevists had infiltrated Winnipeg's labor movement and that this was a coordinated effort to violently overthrow the government of Winnipeg and replace it with a communist dictatorship. This idea was there right from the beginning and was part of the reporting in most but not all of the newspapers covering the story. For example, on May 16th, the Vancouver World ran a headline that read, Soviet government is in control in Winnipeg. On May 22nd, in the Winnipeg Citizen, quote, the red element which planned to bring about anarchy in this country and on the ruins build a tyranny is made up of a small junta of avowed Bolshevists who have succeeded by persistent scheming in taking the place of the sane leaders with an almost solid foreign-born following. Also connected to all of this was the idea of one big union, which would represent all the workers in Western Canada. This was a real idea. The Trades and Labor Congress of Canada had discussed it at the Western Labor Conferences on March 13th of 1919. But the one big union didn't exist yet, and it would not formally form in Calgary until June 4th, at which point the strike was well underway. Even so, there was this widespread perception that the one big union was behind the strike and that all of it was an alien plot. They came to this conclusion even though that union didn't exist yet. It did not help that the one big union idea was also connected to the industrial workers of the world, aka the Wobblies, which were so widely reviled and were the targets and producers of so much propaganda that it is still hard to tell what was real and what wasn't. We talked about them in our Bisbee deportation episode. Uh, Just ignore the times that we accidentally called them the international workers of the world. You know, that was my fault. Sometimes these (laughs) things happen. (laughs) To be clear, there were certainly Bolshevists and communists among Winnipeg's labor unions and among the striking workers. The striking workers were not a monolith. Some wanted to strike for better pay and working conditions and recognition of their labor unions and labor councils. Others were certainly a lot more radical and thought that capitalism itself needed to be replaced with some other more equitable system. And some of the language that was used among the strikers did praise the Russian Revolution and favored a more socialist or communist economic system, but there is no indication at all that this strike was part of a huge conspiracy to violently overthrow the Canadian government. Even so, the government and the Citizens Committee heavily pushed the idea that this whole thing was the result of Soviet and communist influences. They insisted that aliens were to blame and characterized Winnipeg's growing Slavic and Jewish immigrant community as having taken over Winnipeg's labor. They maintained this position in spite of the fact that almost all of the prominent organizers of the strike itself were people who had immigrated to Canada from Britain not from somewhere else in Europe. In fact, there were no new immigrants from Eastern or Central Europe on the strike committee at all. The government and the Citizens Committee also maintained this position in spite of the fact that as many as 85% of Winnipeg's returning veterans were in support of the strike, and veterans became increasingly visible among the strikers as time went on. This ultimately became violent, and we're going to talk about that after we first pause for a little sponsor break. The Winnipeg general strike managed to unite workers all through Winnipeg, largely cutting across gender, ethnicity, and economic status. Its size and its scope were unprecedented in Canadian history. But at the same time, the government of Manitoba didn't really want to get involved in the early days of the strike. It left it largely up to the Strike Committee and the Citizens Committee of 1000 and the city government to try to work it out among themselves. As we noted earlier, the strike began on May 15th. The Winnipeg Tribune joined the strike, returning to work on May 24th. On the 26th, postal workers were ordered to return to their posts, but refused. On May 29th, about 2,000 veterans marched to the Capitol to demand that employers be required to recognize collective bargaining rights. 
Two days later, 10,000 people made the same march to hear Premier Tobias Norris's response. But he told them that was not within his control. On June 4th, a different group of veterans, ones who opposed the strike, marched to the Capitol to offer their assistance to restore order. On June 5th, there were two different veterans' parades, one opposing the strike and one supporting it. And that same day, the province banned parades. There are a lot of parades. <laughs> There's a lot, yeah. There's a lot of marching. I mean, the same things that you see in other strikes were all happening here. There was a lot of marching, a lot of demonstrating, all of that going on through all of this. And although the government of Manitoba was reluctant to get involved, the federal government was concerned that this strike might spread to other cities. So in early June, Gideon Robertson, who was Minister of Labor, and Arthur Megan, who was Minister of the Interior and Acting Minister of Justice, came to Winnipeg to assess this situation. But they only met with the Citizens Committee of 1000. They did not meet with the Strike Committee or any of the strikers. Through all of this, there were lectures, demonstrations, educational events, and a coordinated outreach program largely staffed by women to distribute food and supplies to the striking workers. As we noted earlier, most of the leaders of the strike were immigrants to Canada from Britain. And on June 6, Canada changed the terms of the Immigration Act to allow British-born immigrants to Canada and naturalized Canadian citizens to be deported if they were charged with sedition. Parliament also expanded the definition of sedition in the criminal code to also make the definition more broad as well as include guilt by association. On June 9th, Winnipeg's police force was ordered to return to work, denounce the strike, and sign loyalty oaths. They refused, and the city fired them all, replacing them with a force of 1,800 special constables, known as specials, most of whom were affiliated with the Citizens Committee of 1,000. They were armed with clubs and received a salary that was higher than the police officers they were replacing. A day later, a riot broke out after specials on horseback, armed with clubs, charged into a demonstration. On June 12th, a mass gathering in Victoria Park was nicknamed Ladies' Day for its focus on working women. By that point, workers in other parts of Canada were starting to strike in support of the workers in Winnipeg as well. On June 14th, the Vancouver Sun scheduled an editorial titled No Revolution in Vancouver, that prompted that paper's workers to walk off the job for four days. Canada's railroad unions hadn't participated in the strike, and in early June, they had offered to act as mediators. Railroad workers' union structure was very similar to what the building workers had and what the metal workers wanted. Individual unions rolled up into the federated trades, and then the federated trades rolled up to an organization called Division 4. Division 4 appointed the negotiating committee, which negotiated for all the member unions. On June 16th, after ongoing negotiations through the railroad unions, the big three metal companies agreed to negotiate with the separate metalworking unions, but they made no mention of the Metal Trades Council. They made this agreement under huge pressure from Gideon Robertson, the Minister of Labor, who was worried that if this strike went a lot longer, the railroad workers who had been acting as mediators might ultimately join it as well. Apart from the huge impact this would have by shutting down the railroad, if the railroad workers joined the strike, that was probably going to cause the strike to just spread through the entire country rather than having a few isolated communities that were supporting the strike with their own strike. The leaders of the railroad unions who had acted as negotiators released a statement that this was the same type of collective bargaining that the railroad workers enjoyed. But it really wasn't. The reason for this about-face is not entirely clear, but the railroad unions were also under a lot of pressure from the Minister of Labor to get things resolved, and they feared they might lose their own union's recognition if they didn't bring things to a close. The General Strike Committee was really not satisfied with this outcome, especially because they had not even seen the last round of proposals during the negotiations before this announcement came about an agreement being reached. There was also just a lack of clarity about exactly how to define collective bargaining. That was yet another layer of complexity in this whole situation. The big three was insisting that workers had collective bargaining powers because they had agreed to recognize the individual unions but the workers, or at least the more elite among the workers, insisted that they did not have collective bargaining because the big three would not recognize the Metal Trades Council. 
The strike committee refused to call off the strike. So on June 17th, the Northwest Mounted Police, aided by specials, raided the homes of several strike leaders and arrested 10 of the most prominent, as well as two members of the One Big Union, which by this point existed. Groups of Eastern European immigrants were arrested as well, and after the strike was over, Canada deported waves of immigrants who were suspected of Bolshevism or communism. The arrested strike committee members were taken to Stony Mountain Penitentiary, and they included union and labor leaders John Queen, A.A. Heaps, Robert Lloyd Russell, and George Armstrong. Armstrong's wife, Helen, was the head of the Women's Labor League and was one of the strike's most visible women. She refused to let the authorities take her husband until she had confirmation that they actually had a warrant. William Ivins of the Western Labor News was also arrested, as was Roger E. Bray, who was a former private in the Canadian Army who had been trying to rally support for the strike among military veterans. Initially, the plan was to immediately deport the British-born strike leadership. But it became clear that even people who were opposed to the strike thought this was extreme. So authorities charged them with seditious conspiracy and planned to bring them to trial. Four days after these arrests, on June 21st, striking workers held a silent parade. That day, the city's streetcars had started running again, and the demonstrators stopped one of the streetcars and tipped it over. This prompted the Northwest Mounted Police and the specials to charge into the strikers, killing two people and injuring at least 30. Nearly 100 people were arrested. This incident was nicknamed Bloody Saturday, and afterward, federal troops occupied the city of Winnipeg. At this point, the strike's most vocal and radical leadership had been arrested, leaving more moderate people in charge. And people began to fear that there would be more violence and more deaths if the strike continued. So on June 25th, 1919, the strike ended, and the workers who had not been fired for striking returned to their jobs. In the end, this strike achieved almost none of its goals. The metal workers' hours were reduced by five per week, which was less than the reduction they had asked for, but that was really it. Civic employees were also required to sign documents attesting that they would not strike again in the future before they were allowed to return to their jobs. Afterward, there was a hugely bitter divide between labor and capital. The Citizens Committee of 1000 continued to try to undermine labor organization long after the strike was over. The strike and the committee's continued work had an overall chilling effect on labor activism immediately afterward. In July of 1919, a commission was convened to investigate what had happened during the strike. Justice R.A. Robeson led the inquiry and rejected the idea that it was a revolution meant to overthrow the government. His report supported the idea that this was a dispute over the issue of collective bargaining and that the strike was not seditious in its character. In spite of that, several of the strike's leaders were tried for seditious conspiracy in November of 1919 and in the early months of 1920 in prosecutions that were funded by the Department of Justice under the War Appropriation Act. Robert Boyd Russell was convicted in December 1919. On March 27, 1920, six other leaders were convicted of seditious conspiracy. Roger E. Bray was also convicted of being a common nuisance. That immediate chilling effect on Canada's labor movement started to lift as these trials were happening. Labor leaders were elected in both municipal and provincial elections in 1919 and 1920. Some of those leaders were still incarcerated for the role in the strike that they had played when they were elected. The Conservative Party was defeated in the 1921 federal election, and the newly elected government promised labor reforms. Provinces also started enacting collective bargaining legislation in the 1940s, with the federal government enacting a collective bargaining statute in 1948. After being released, many of the strike's leaders went on to be active in the labor movement and in the government. John Queen and William Ivins both served in the Manitoba legislature, and John Queen served as the mayor of Winnipeg for seven non-consecutive terms. Abraham Heaps was elected as a member of parliament. J.S. Woodsworth had been charged in connection to the strike, but those charges were later dropped. He became a member of Parliament as well. He also helped found the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which later became the New Democratic Party. Since this year's the 100th anniversary of the strike happening, there's been a lot going on related to it in the last few years. A monument to the strike was unveiled at Lily Street at Market Avenue in 2017. 
That monument is made of metal to honor the striking metal workers. A bloody Saturday monument was scheduled to be unveiled on June 21st, 2019. That is after we are recording this podcast, but before the podcast is coming out. There's also been a lot of 100th anniversary stuff happening in Winnipeg, including a huge labor conference to sort of commemorate it and function as a labor conference. Do you have listener mail? Uh, I do have listener mail. I'm not sure the name of the listener who has sent this. They didn't sign the email. But it says, I was wondering if you could provide more context regarding the Quakers and others that would not have the bell rung for them that were referenced. That was in the Samuel Pepys episode. Mainly, why would Quakers not want the bell rung? And why even were we were ringing the bell in the first place? I listen on the regular and appreciate the stimulating thoughts you conjure up the rest of the day after listening to this pod. So thank you for this email. So that was in the Samuel Pepys episode. In Samuel Pepys' diary about how many people had died of the plague, he made a comment about how the number might actually be a lot higher because of Quakers and others who would not have the bell rung for them. So... There were bells being rung for lots of different reasons uh, at this point in London, and then specifically during the plague for multiple reasons. Um, Bells would be rung at churches when deaths were reported, and bells would also be rung at burials. Part of this was required by law. The idea was that if there were these bells ringing every time somebody died, then maybe people would remember to take precautions about the plague. Um, But all of this bell ringing was happening when people had a church that they were part of and were being buried in the churchyard. Um, And Quakers and other people who were part of, like, non-conforming denominations were generally being buried in their own graveyard that wasn't part of a church and did not have that church bell connected to it. So um, I think that's what he's referring to in terms of the bell not being rung, Uh, usually um, when Quakers and others were buried, that just wasn't part of the the funeral or the the death notification. So that has led to some um, lack of clarity in terms of the death records from the plague, because a lot of the record keeping was being kept through formal church channels. So if you were part of a nonconforming religion that did not have those church channels, your death might not ever be formally recorded. So. Thank you for that question. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we are all over social media at Missed in History. That is where you will find our Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Twitter, all of that. You can come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, and find a searchable archive of all the episodes we have worked on and uh, show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have done together. And you can subscribe to our show in Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 